Wow, what a day yesterday. How many of you were here for the service yesterday? Can I see your hands? Wow, we had a, we had a slew full of people. And I don't know what that means. There's just a lot of people here. And uh, I was so touched uh, by just the support of all of the friends of Barbara and Pete Kingman who came out and celebrated her life. It was very special. I couldn't say enough uh, things about Barbara myself, and we're so glad that the family came, her mom was able to come, her brothers. We were just really blessed. It was, uh, I had person after person that spoke to me and said they were so touched by the service, so encouraged, and, and I don't know. Did you feel that way? Yeah, it was, it was a, a real presence, I think, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the sense of loss was still there, but also the sense of joy. And I think that was covered pretty well in the things that were spoken about. And so we're just very, very glad. Thank you so much, all of you. The work that went on over this time, the number of people uh, that just said, what can I do, what can I do? And they came and they did. And uh, just great thanks to all uh, for your sacrificial service uh, for the Kingmans, but all we know ultimately is for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's whom we serve. So thank you for that. And I wanted to say something here. Now, I didn't know, and I, I, don't, I hate to embarrass people. You know I do, right? I mean, really, I do hate to embarrass people, but I will do it, right? Am I, is that okay to embarrass somebody? Yeah. Well, I didn't know, but uh, this last week, you know, I've been watching my stuff on the Facebook and, you know, how you do that. And we, we first, we were so thrilled to have Patrick and Maurice have a successful transplant. That was huge. And all that went on involved in that down at Jackson. And to have them home uh, already, and, you know, that's just amazing. We were so thrilled with that. So we had that going on. A lot of different things were going on. But um, uh, around the world... On the other side of the globe, in Nanjing, China, there was a special uh, event going on, a worldwide gathering of the elite athletes of the world were gathering for a form of Olympics, a Junior Olympics that was taking place there. And they basically were having everything that was going on that uh, would go on in a regular Olympics. And it was really big and really special. And uh, we knew that one of ours was going to be there, and I didn't know she was going to be here today, or I wouldn't do this to you. She's not here. Where is she? Is she on the plane still? She's hiding. She's still there. Okay, well, anyhow, just let me share this with you all there, that uh, in, uh, in the competition, Clara Smitty was competing for the United States, and I uh, believe on the second day, and if you want to go on my Facebook page, you're welcome to do that and look up or Rebecca's and you'll see that, uh, and you can go and watch the entire event. And she won a gold medal, a hundred, hundred meter backstroke. And listen, it was an incredible race, an incredible finish. And uh, great testimony, just the sweetness that, that Clara has always shown. She's tough, she's got to be, to be able to compete like that. But the sweetness with her competitors that were there, and just what was said about her, you need to see it on the video play. And just to say, wow. You know, I think of her working, growing up here, and working in Awana, and working with kids and stuff. But there's another side, and we know that the whole family has worked together in this uh, pursuit and development of skills and talents for the glory of the Lord. And so, uh, and, for, and when they did the Star Spangled Banner, I had tears, man. I mean, I was just like, are you, I'm thinking about it now, you know, because it was just so special. And, uh, you know, because just to know the person and what they represent and to see them honored in such a way. You know, God does honor. God says, humble yourself under the hand of the Lord and he will lift you up. There's a time where we seek the gold medal. I remember a question one time was asked a group of athletes, and I used to be involved somewhat in athletics and coaching and uh, in college and so forth. And, and I knew what it was uh, to want to win. Um, I tried my best to win and to set records and all that kind of stuff. And I know how short-lived it is. 
but I know it was important at a time. There was asked a question to a group of athletes, and they were particularly field event athletes that were asked this. That means shot put, discus, you know, the, the weightlifting. And they asked them this question. If you knew you could take drugs to enhance your performance and win a gold medal, and yet it would cause you to die within your 30th year or in your 30s, would you do it? And what was remarkable, I'm not quoting that exactly, but what was remarkable was this, is that the majority of the athletes said they would use drugs if it was able to, even if it, they knew it was gonna cut their life short in order to win a gold medal. That winning the gold medal meant so much to them, they would sacrifice the half of their life. And I was astounded by that. I mean, I know, and maybe it's just I'm not that driven of a person. You know, to, to trade years of life for a piece of gold that you sit and, you know, and, and, and I never won an Olympic gold medal, but I've had some gold medals, you know, and some trophies. And I go, wow, they don't look very good anymore. Anybody have any of those old stuff from high school and college? And you look at them and you go, boy, it looked a whole lot better 40 years ago. That's because your eyes were better then too. But, <laughs> you know, and so we look at this and this, this is, if it's only in the medal, if it's not about what it did inside of you, the character that was developed in you, the perseverance, the willingness to work for goals, the things that shape your life into long-term direction, later to be used by many by God, so that he could use that to see those same character issues used in you in his service. I believe everything I did back in my days in sports was all about getting me ready for the ministry that God had for me. And little did I know that the hardest race I would ever run in my life would be right here at Southwest Community Church and making it through each week and, and dealing with all the things that come along in a week. You have no idea what's happened over 25 years, all the events that have taken place and the lives. And I believe it took every bit of lesson that I learned and probably I should have learned a lot more, but I just wasn't learning it at the time. And so the rest of it, if my life was only for a gold medal, or Clara's was only for a gold medal, then that's vainglory. That's emptiness. And to trade off your life for that? Well, let me ask you something. I'm going to get personal with you for a second. What are you trading your life for? What do you trade your days for? Your energy? Your work? What are you trading it for? Is it for money? Maybe you're vainglory in the gold medal. Maybe it's gold. Or maybe it's property. Or maybe you're trading your life for, for getting more a higher position. Did you know that at, there's so many people that are working and living for themselves. They've got goals they want for themselves that it drives them and they don't know why they're so hollow, empty inside. Especially if you ever get your goal. You will see how empty it is by itself. It's all the other things that are important that are along the way. I would like you to open up your notes and you'll see we're in Philippians chapter 2. And we're studying something about what it means to have a meaningful life and that Christ is all I need. And we're going to look at today because it's all about Him, not me. We're going to learn something that is really, really a, a I would have to say it's so counterculture. I had to take a picture in the next slide in here. And I want you to see in this, can you all tell what that is? That's a salmon. What's the salmon doing? Swimming upstream against the current. And I want to tell you that the words that I'm sharing with you today are just like all the salmon of the world swimming upstream against the current because the current in the world today is going to tell you everything I'm saying you shouldn't listen to. It's wrong. Don't listen to that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And all I'm going to do is share with you the words of Christ. I'm going to show you Christ's life. I'm going to show you how Christ lived his life and how he has given us a model of how we can live our life. And if we will do this, I will guarantee you something. You will have a life that is full of meaning and purpose. And at the end, you will not say it meant nothing. I guarantee that on the word of God. I guarantee it. Do you know people have not changed in 2,000 years? 
Did you know that the people of the day of the Apostle Paul are much like today? They just don't have the media. They don't have Twitter. They don't have Fritter. And they don't have Facebook. Okay? But you know, they had the same issues of life. They had the same desires. They didn't have the same opportunities or the same technology. But had they had those, they would be the same as we are today. No different. They were idolatrous. They lived for the work of their own hands. They, they had their idols and their spirits. There's nothing changed. They were religious without God. They had the way of making themselves feel good by being good people, quote. They had their class stratifications in which they all earned and found their place in life. Listen, there were no differences there. They were much the same. What did people basically do then? They looked out for number one. They looked out for themselves. But what they found out was this. There's something that happens when you look out for yourself. A self-focused life will be these things, shallow, frustrating, and meaningless in the end. Shallow, frustrating, and meaningless in the end. So this begs the question, is there another way to live life? Well, I'm going to present to you an alternative. Okay, I'd be really amiss if I didn't. And uh, so our text today is going to be Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Now, we're just going to go through this. We're going to learn it. We're going to look at a few things in each of the verses. And as we do, you can make notes on the side. I do have some notes that are available in the back. And so you can go and, and take those if you want. They'll also be online uh, as we normally do. Philippians 2, 1. The apostle now is addressing the church at Philippi. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any what? fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. Now look at the words that are used in this. I mean, this is an interesting loaded question. Is there any encouragement in Christ? The word encouragement there is paraclesis. It's the calling to one's aid. Listen, how many of you have AAA? Anybody have AAA? Okay, you're out on, on the uh, uh, Palmetto Expressway, your car breaks down, you're in the lane and cars are flying by, you're over, just pulled over on the side. Uh, you're a AAA member, you have your cell phone. What do you do? Well, you don't call Ghostbusters, okay? You call AAA. Now, when you call for AAA to come, you expect them to do what? To come and to do what? To help you in your time of need. Now, when you call and you make a call for someone to come and help you and get you out of that situation, are you not now encouraged and maybe alive where you think you may have been run over on the road? Well, of course you are. And so we see this in their encouragement, the idea of calling to one's aid. That's what the word means, to call to one's aid, just like a child who calls a parent when they're struggling with a problem and they don't know how to take care of it. And they call, Mom, Dad, Paraclesis, call to one's aid. Come alongside. And they find encouragement. And a lot of times, it's encouragement that causes us to win the race, isn't it? Nobody ever wins a race. I've never seen anybody win a race on their own. They've always had people call to one side, encouraging them along the way. And so then we have another word for that that's used in there. If there's any consolation of love, what is it that the love gives us? Another form of encouragement. Paramuthion is the word that's used there. It's a word that means to exhort, to encourage. I, let me ask you something in here. Did, did your kids ever get involved in sports? Did you ever go and cheer for them? Have you, ever, have you ever noticed parents cheering for their kids? They don't stand out, do they? Watch out if the referee makes a wrong call. I found that out the hard way. I was amazed at how emotional and biased I am. I am very emotional and very biased, and I've seen many bad calls, and I was so willing to let that be known. <laughs> Why? Because I'm out there, and there's my kid, my kid's involved, and they're doing something, and I want them to do well, and I'm encouraging them, and you know, I know this, that even though they were maybe embarrassed, they were also encouraged, and they knew that I cared, and that I was willing to make a fool of myself in order to encourage them to succeed. Don't you need that in your life? Who's your encourager in life now? You see, what they're saying here is that encouragement, that, that, that coming alongside call for help, the idea of being one that is encouraged by exhortation, did you know that's one another? Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your, your kids, maybe it's your mentor. 
that does that for you. But God has this for us. He says, if there's any encouragement or consolation of love in Christ, well, there is. And there's the fellowship of the Spirit. That's the word fellowship is koinonia. The idea of that shared activity that we do together. Sharing something that we do together. And that brings fellowship in the Spirit. Yesterday, we experienced that. Did you know many of us did different jobs yesterday? Some of you were bringing in people and letting, finding them a seat. Others were up doing the sound, doing the, the video, setting up or moving flowers, setting up the cafeteria. Everybody was doing different jobs, but we were all working for one goal. Was that not an encouragement to be a part of it? Didn't you sense a sense of the Spirit in that? The Holy Spirit working? That's what the body of Christ does. He works together. And so we're a team in that sense. And so Philippians 2.1, great intro to this. So now Paul says, if there's any of those things in the Christ, those things that you've already experienced already as a church, look at verse 2. Make my joy complete, he says. Make my joy full. The word for that complete there is the word that is used to make full. It's a word that's commonly used in the scriptures for that particular idea. To fill me up with joys. Fill me up with joy in seeing you enjoying all of you who you have and what you are in Christ. And so he says there, maintain the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. You know, it's interesting that united in spirit is the word sumsukos. It's the idea of having one mind, having one mind. You know, it's often difficult in a day and age like we have today of individualism. Because everybody says, well, I have my own opinion. And I don't care what yours is. I have my own mind. Well, as believers, we're told to have the mind of Christ, aren't we? Aren't we supposed to have the mind of Christ? You can say amen to that, folks. You don't, you don't have to be asleep. Okay. Uh, we are of one mind in Christ. If we have Christ's mind and then Christ has given us his mind, we can do that. Well, what about being one mind as a body in Christ, as a church? One mind and a goal, trying to reach the community we have for Christ. One mind and community, trying to reach the youth in Awana. One mind and community, trying to reach the youth in our high school and junior high, college and career ministries. One mind in our Sunday school program. One mind because we're doing all of this thinking through the ideas and the priorities. And we're together. And this is what Paul is saying here. This is what brings him joy. In order to do that, for you to have one mind means you have to yield your mind to somebody else. And that's what we don't want to do. No, we don't want to do that. I have my own mind. I have my own way I want to go. And a lot of people, you're so self-stubborn about what you want to do that it's keeping you from connecting with the body of Christ and finding purpose in your life because you're still concerned about yourself more than you are about the body of Christ. And Paul said, love, one mind, all of this brings joy, not only to the leadership, but also to Christ. Look at what he says in verse 3. Let's get a little deeper in here. Now it's really going to start meddling in our lives. Do nothing from what? Why don't you circle that word? Circle it in your notes, in the bulletin there. Do nothing from what? Say it again. Selfishness. Selfishness. We'll start with that one. Selfishness. The word selfishness there is erethea. The word means rivalry. Rivalry. Now think of it this way, that it sets you up against everybody else. That's what the word selfish means. It sets you up and you're good, you're the team, you're, you're against everybody else. In our world of competitiveness, we set up rivalries and we esteem them highly because they make us work harder to be better so we can be the champion. The problem with that is, if that is our end goal, it's empty. There's always going to be somebody better eventually. So who wins? The problem here is, is that Erethea that he's talking about in here, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Now the word empty conceit is a very important word, kinodoxia. And the idea of doxia or teaching is one part of it. And the kino in there is from the word to uh, empty yourself. Later, it's going to be used in a very important verse, later in verse 7, in a different form. But the idea here is, is that there is an emptiness of looking out for yourself. And he says, do nothing. What does do nothing mean? 
means nothing, right? Isn't that complicated? You know, the Greek says the same thing. I'm going to tell you something. You know a little Greek? Here it is. I know a little less. It means do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But on contrary, the word but there is a contrast. But with what of mind? Humility of mind. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Ouch. Does that hurt? Ouch. I want you to imagine this, that the Lord Jesus Christ was here and he was speaking, not me. I'm speaking for him. I'm just a person who's trying to find his way through life, just like you are. The Lord is speaking to me in this passage, but imagine the Lord is over here and he's the one who's speaking to you right now. And he's telling you, do nothing for your own selves, for your own ambitions. Do nothing from selfish, vain purposes. Rivalry. What are you going to do? Are you going to reevaluate? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? Am I, am I being like Christ, like the apostles instructing. I mean, it is the words of God here. We're getting God's word. This isn't somebody just came up with some ideas on how to live. This is the word of God. Because not only is it instructing us on what to do, Jesus, in the next verses, becomes our example of one who did it. What kind of humility of mind are we supposed to have? We look at others as more important than ourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. When you come to church, do you listen to see what people need? Are you open to hear the wounded heart? Are you coming in looking for a way, Lord, how can I help somebody out today? Or are you just coming in looking at your watch and thinking about what you're going to do for lunch? Well, others may be coming in today and they don't have a lunch to go home to. Maybe they're out of money. Maybe they've been out of a job. Did you know, unless you ask, you will not know? And then if you do know, do you really want to help? Are you willing to go out of your way to help somebody else? Do you see how personal this gets? What are you going to do? Do nothing. Don't just look out for your own interests. Look out for the interests of others. You know what it says in here? It says to hold other people more important than yourself. Do you know what the word is important there? Hooper echo. It's a, it's a combination of two words. And it means to hold above, to rise above to the point where you are superior to someone else. Boy, is that cut. So how does this get summed up in what we're supposed to do? Look at verse 5. There's our example. Have this what? Now, a lot of times we go to kids. I don't like your attitude. Or we need to have an attitude change, right? You ever hear about that? You need to change your attitude. Well, let me tell you something. Folks, all of us, including me, I'm not, I'm not outside of this. All of us need to change our attitude every day. Because our natural inclination is to be selfish and live for vain glory. That is our natural tendency. And to do other than that is going to require supernatural Strength that comes from God through His Holy Spirit. Have this attitude. What attitude? The attitude that was in Christ. The word attitude is the word phreneo. It means to have understanding, to think. To have an understanding. What is this attitude we have to have? We have to have the understanding of what Christ had. Although He existed in the form of God, and by the way, there's no higher than that, He did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Nothing. Nothing. What was the attitude of Christ? Look in your Bibles to Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, and I'll share it with you. What was the attitude of Christ? There's two clues I'm going to share with you. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Love to hear the sound of a Bible being opened. That's good. Oh. Matthew eleven twenty nine. And if you're listening at home on the internet, I encourage you to have your Bible open. And go to Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. 
Jesus is speaking here to us through his word. And he says this, take my what? Take my yoke upon you. Now, he's not talking about the inner part of an egg. All right? A lot of you have a yoke. Don't wear the yolks on you. You can laugh. All right. It's, it's, make me feel good. Okay? My vain glory needs it. Okay? Take my yoke. The idea of the yoke, you know, sharing the, the, the burden. This is what Jesus tells him. Take my yoke on you. This is my burden. Learn from me. Learn from me. What am I? Here's his attitude. I am gentle and what? Humble in heart. And you, here's what you do. You do that, you will find rest for your souls. Do you have a soul that needs rest? Learn from Christ. He's gentle and humble in heart. Look at Romans chapter 15, verse 3. Another attitude check. For even Christ did not please himself. Think about that. Christ did not go about pleasing himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached thee, they fell upon him. The exact opposite happened. He said he existed in the form of God. This is very, very important teaching here. He existed in the form of God. Who was Jesus? Was he just a man? No, he was not just a man. He existed in the form of God. That means his being. The word exist in here means his being. It was who he was. And he, he, was, he was the essence of God. Hupu Arco. He was the essence of God. He existed in the form of God. And he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or something that had to be taken and grabbed a hold of. He already was God. He didn't have to try to be God. He is God. John 1.1. 1, 1. You're familiar with that verse, right? In the beginning was the... And the Word was... Was with God and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, He became flesh. And we beheld his glory. The word became flesh. And we beheld his glory. Equality with God is something that is all about Jesus. Jesus was very clear that he portrayed himself as being the God man. Equal God, equal man. Not a good man and not a fake man. Some people believe he was a spirit. He was not a spirit. He was a man. Look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. John 5.18. Might want to write this one down. It says in here that it, when he was, was, the Jews went around, the Jewish, that is the Jewish unbelievers of the leadership that their day went around trying to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father. He was making himself equal with God. They understood his message. It's a shame so many people 2,000 years later, they look back on it and they can't see it. John 10, 33, the Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you. Or they were trying to. But for blasphemy, because you being a what? A man, you make yourself out to be God. He was equal with God. Don't let it ever come out. Jesus Christ was fully God as well as fully man. But in order for him to be fully man, he had to do something with his God rights and powers. And what he did was he laid them aside. Now that's got to be awful hard. That's got to be awful hard to do. I can't even imagine it. Look at verse 7. One of the greatest passages in the Bible. It's, so much is in this. It stands out among many of the passages in the Bible. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and made in the likeness of men. The word empty in here comes from the word canoe. It, it's not like canoe, like a, go canoeing. It's, in theology, it's called the kenosis. And maybe you've studied it in that form, this idea of the kenosis. Do you know what it means? It's the great emptying of himself. It's the laying aside of his powers. 
the laying aside of his omni powers, the omni attributes of God. He was never separated from the Father there, but he laid aside his powers so that he could be a man and be fully man. It's very difficult to understand this, but this is the way he's, he's revealed it to us. It's very clear. It says in this, he became a bondservant. The word for bondservant is the word doulos. We've heard it before. It meant a slave. Here is the king becoming a slave that is not fitting in our world. It would be like, it would be like having the CEO of a company serving as the doorman. And there's nothing wrong with being a doorman. But the idea of the, of the contrast in positions between the doorman in a building and the CEO of the company, or maybe the owner of the company, like Donald Trump and the person that's shining shoes in the hallway out there as you go into one of his buildings. Now imagine Donald Trump changing his hair. <laughs> that's a trip. Imagine him putting on ordinary clothes. Imagine him going down to the basement, at the entrance level of the employees. Imagine him putting up a shoe shine store there to shine the shoes of the people coming in to work for him. Would that happen? Do you think that would happen today? I don't think so. I think you'd be fired if you thought that and told him that. Jesus did much more than that. Do you understand the difference? To have the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the universe, creator, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, to come and take the form of the lowest slave on earth, to take the point of which he would not only do the biddings of the Father, but for the good of other people, he was going to lay himself down completely and die so that you might have eternal life? Listen, it's hard enough to imagine Donald Trump doing that or any person in his position. But to imagine the God of the universe doing that, I have a really hard time imagining what happened. But the word of God reveals that that's what he did. He emptied himself. He laid aside his privileges and he took on the form of a bondservant. That's what it says, the form of a bondservant. And he was made in the likeness of men. The word that's used there for the likeness of men is, is used in a four three, three or four different verses. I'm going to share with you a couple of them here. It means that which is made like something. John 1.14, the word became flesh. That's what the idea is here. The word became flesh. Romans 8.3, it said he's condemned sin, sending his own son in the likeness of human, sinful human flesh. He sent him in the likeness of it. He didn't have sinful flesh. Jesus never sinned. He was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. Hebrews 2.17, therefore he had to be made like his brothers. Why? In all things, that he might become a merciful. Why, did he, why was he made this way? So he could become one who would understand your needs, understand your weakness, understand my faults, understand the, the things of the whys that happen in our life and still knowing completely the justice and uh, the perfect justice that God demands. And so he would look at that and he would be able to understand and put these together. And he said he might be a faithful and merciful high priest in things pertaining to God. And what did that mean? To make propitiation for the sins of the people. The priest would go and he would go before God with the death blood of animals. And he would offer those as propitiation to the people for you. And Jesus, in order to do this as the priest, the great high priest that he would be, the Hebrews tells us, he came and offered his blood, not the blood of an animal. And he offered it for you and me. Because he laid aside his powers in order to offer himself as the sacrifice the one sacrifice that could actually take away sin. All the others covered it, never took it away. Jesus covered it. He was the perfect sacrifice. And he says in this that this is what he did and he wanted to be like his brethren, so he had to be this way so that he could make propitiation 
for the sins of the people. 1 John 4, 10. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. Propitiation. Substitutionary payment for our sins. That's what He did. And verse 8, moving to Philippians 2, 8, and being found in appearance as a man. In appearance as a man, He was fully man. God, fully man. He humbled Himself. Again, it's used in that word again. He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Did you ever wonder what Jesus thought about dying on the cross? Did you ever wonder what he thought? Look at Matthew 26, 39. I'll give you a thought. I'll give you a little picture in his mind. It's recorded for us. My father, he says in his prayer, my father, he goes to the father, God the father, God the son, God the Holy Spirit. My father says the son on earth and here, and he says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. In other words, not what I want, it's what you want. What was Jesus saying there? He says, it's not about me, it's about you, Father. That's what he was saying. That's what life is. And that was even to the point of death. John 10, 18, Jesus said, no one has taken my, my life away. No one takes it away from me. I lay it down. I lay my life down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This is what I have been instructed by my Father. Romans 5.19, it says in here that, that even though one man brought sin into the world and all of sin came out of a series of bad decisions that were made by one person, it came all the way down to where we are today, and all the death and suffering and misery and wars that have resulted from that sin were all a part of a genesis at one point in time. The tree goes to one. And we have added many to our own. And we've added it down the line with our children and our grandchildren until the day comes in which all this has to be reconciled and accounted for. And look what Jesus did here. Even so, through the obedience of the one, many will be made righteous. Through Christ, we're made righteous. That's why the writer of Hebrews said, we fix our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, for the joy he saw in front of him, look at how he felt about the cross. He despised the shame. What do you despise? Have you ever been shamed? Have you ever thought of, you know, when, and when I was a kid in elementary school, you know what the worst thing would be in my mind? I had these dreams. I had paranoid dreams about this. I always woke up in school and I was either in my underwear or in my pajamas. And for somehow, I had no clue how I got into school doing that. It's elementary. It's, it must be something in the psychology of weird kids like me. That I, I had this dream and it was repeat, I repeated it. And all of a sudden, I was just being found. And everybody was looking at me. And I wanted to die. I, I oh, don't, don't look at me. Where are my clothes? How can I get out of the house without my clothes on? I was shamed. That was shame to me as a kid. Okay? I can think of things worse than that now. But that was pretty bad. Jesus despised the shame. Sometimes we flippantly say, Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. I want you to understand something. Don't remove the shame out of it. He didn't just die for your cross, your sins. He took your shame had you gone before a judge who revealed every thought in your mind, had a, an ability to uncode your mind and put all the sin and the evil thoughts and the evil rivalries you've had and the self vainglory and all the things that you've done in your life and all the wickedness and all the... You put all of that up on a screen up here so that everybody could see. How would you like that? Would that be shame? Yes, it would be. And Jesus despised the shame of what he went through so you and I will never... Go through that shame. That screen has been erased. The files are deleted through the blood of Christ. Do you understand that? You don't have to be, ever be afraid again. That's why he's not embarrassed to call you his son or daughter. Do you know Christ is your Savior? You're forgiven. 
Do you know Christ as your Savior? You're His child. He's adopted you into His family. And it's a complete and real adoption. Yesterday I was really touched by Stephen and John and their testimony to Barbara and Pete. And one of the things that I saw in that was the love of God through Barbara and Pete when they adopted Stephen and John and made them their child. A love child chosen to be a part of their family. And God did that for you because he was willing to endure the shame. So you wouldn't have to. What do you say? What did God do? What is the result of that? And what is the pattern for us? Verses 9, 10, and 11. Real simple. Verse 9, God highly exalted him. How high did God exalt him? By lifting his name above every name there is. There is no name higher than the name of Jesus. Hebrews 1.9 says that thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. Matthew 28.18 says that all authority has been given to Jesus in heaven and on earth. Let me tell you something. People who play around with Jesus do not understand that all authority, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be delivered. There is no other name under heaven that will be any higher than Jesus for all eternity. And when it comes to the day of judgment, all decisions end in Jesus' court. I want to tell you something. Be careful what you say about Jesus, especially if you're not a trusted believer in him, because it's all going to come back and you will bear your shame to the grave and beyond forever. That's a warning. Acts 2.33, having been exalted to the right hand of God. He says, to the right hand of God. That's a very exalted position. This is what he's talking about. Hebrews 2.9. Look at that verse. Look at it in your Bible. We do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. Him, who? Jesus. Made a little while for a time being on earth. He was a little while lower than the angels. His name? Jesus. It's right there. And because of the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God Almighty, Jesus might taste death for every man. Every one of you, he tasted death for. Now you may not believe, but he tasted the death. And the word doesn't mean nibbled at. Many ate it. He ate death. Jesus didn't go and die. Put it, oh, I'm gonna put my foot in the water. Oh, that's the, I don't like that. So he only taste, no, he didn't taste it. The idea in there is he ate it. He ate the death for all man. Why? So that everybody could have the option of eternal life. Oh, please, chew on that. That's his love. That's his humility. He made it available for all, but not all take it. Eventually, some are going to still have to acknowledge his authority and his power. And so that in verse 10, he says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and on earth and then under the earth. And so there's a time coming when every knee is going to bow to Jesus. Every knee. It will be no option in it. You can be as proud as you want today and say, well, I'm never going to do that. Yeah, you ain't there yet. I hope you never are. I hope you've crossed over and become a part of the redeemed instead of those who are the lost. Because in that day, it's too late. There is no second chance. You make your choices here. It's the way it is. Thus says Jehovah, who created the heavens, Isaiah 45. Look and listen to this. For thus says Jehovah, who created the heavens, the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it a waste place. He formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am Jehovah, and there's none else. I'm the one who did this. Turn to me and be saved, verse 22. <coughs> At all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there's no other. I have sworn by myself, he said. The word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness. It will not turn back. What, what, did, what did he say? Look at Isaiah 45, 23. That to me, says Jehovah, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. Ooh, what's that sound like? Does that sound a little bit like 
that the, uh, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Ooh, what's he saying here? I guess he's saying something pretty important because Jehovah said that to Isaiah. Isaiah wrote it down. Pretty solemn words. That Jesus is who? Jesus is God, Jehovah, the Yahweh, the I am that I am, in the appearance of a man, in the form of a man, in the likeness of his brothers. Well, that's pretty powerful stuff. And that every tongue, verse 11 concludes in our passage, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, notice it says Jesus Christ. You have to understand that word. Jesus, some people think it's like, you know, Jesus, you know, first name, you know, or Joey. No. The word Jesus means Jehovah who saves. In Hebrew, it might be Yeshua or Joshua. The Lord Jehovah who saves. That's what that word means. Now, Christ is not his last name. Like he wasn't from the Christ family. You know, his last name's Christ. And first name was Joseph. Or, you know, no. His, his name, Christ, is the word in the Greek that means the anointed one. In Hebrew, it would be the equivalent of Messiah, Mashiach. The Lord anointed one, the anointed one, foretold to come. And now it says he's curious. He's God. And it says in here that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. My friends, the people in the Supreme Court one day who have decided to take his word out of our public arena by making it a vile, unconstitutional act to say anything about God, definitely not about Jesus, they are going to stand before the one who is the Lord of the universe, and they will be accountable for their actions. No man can disavow God. No man can take away his glory. No man, no woman can make a decision that is going to change him one bit. He laughs at nations. The nations are a drop in the bucket to him. And if you have a God who is as vulnerable to man, you don't have God. But you try Jesus, the Lord who saves, Jehovah God who saves, the Christ, he is Lord. He is Lord, and there's none other. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said in John, in, in John 13, 13, you call me teacher and Lord. You're right, for so I am. So I am. We're told in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Do you see, when you put your trust in Christ, you're believing he is the Lord, the one who's in charge, the God Almighty. And, and you believe in him, you, you, you acknowledge him as the Lord that you believe in your heart, and God raised him from the dead, you believe that, that's part of the gospel, you shall be saved, delivered. Romans 14, 9. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. My friends, the Bible is very clear. Jesus is Lord. That's why a lot of people don't like him. And they may not like you, but that's okay. It's okay to not be liked because you believe in the truth. It's not fun. It's not easy. But it's okay. Why? Now here's where we go back to. Because it's all about Christ, not about me. Right? It's all about Christ. Here's verse 3. Summarize this message today for you and me. Number one, go to verse 3. Verse 3, down there on your notes. You can put this down in here. Do nothing for self-centered purposes. That's the message in it. Christ is our example where to follow. Do nothing for self-centered purposes. Think you can do that? Try it for a day. You'll find out it's a lot harder than you think. <laughs> Very hard, Okay. Because you're going to be tested today. Guarantee you, you'll be tested if you try it. Verse 7, we jump down, down to verse 7. Just as Christ emptied himself, we are called to do the same thing. It's a lot harder than you think to empty yourself. Well, I am so-and-so, father of a tribe, you know. I am 
a so-and-so position in my work. I see it all the time in LinkedIn. Everybody's important people, okay? Very rarely does anybody say, I am the servant to all. Let me serve you. It's all who I am and what, I can do, what I've done, not what will I do for you. Christ emptied himself, the kenosis. Has the kenosis been a part of your life? Have you been willing to be the servant, the slave of Christ? Paul, who lived the richest life of any human being I know, said that for me to live is what? Christ and to die is gain. He said that in Philippians. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Why? Because he believed those words. He humbled, verse 8, he humbled himself under the Father. He was obedient under the Father. We are called to humble ourselves under Christ. Are we going to be as obedient to Christ as Christ was to the Father? The humble obedience. Obedience is humility. Do you ever think about it? Think about it this way. You ask your child to do something, and he says, no. Is that humility? Is that humbleness? No. That's defiance. It's pride. And every time Christ asks us to do something, and we go, no. See what happens? Try getting rid of that no and say, yes, what do you want me to do? Yes, sir. Some of you taught your children to say, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, Lord. No, Lord. Be careful what you say no to the Lord. In verse 11, the glory that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Everything we do should be for the glory of the Father. Life is all for the glory and honor of Christ. That's why I say it's not about me, it's about him. And frankly, this message today is not about me. I don't really care what you think about me. I don't care what you think about what I just said, except that you need to consider it because I'm having to consider it the same way. In other words, I have to stand before the one that wrote this, the author, okay? And so me saying it doesn't mean I'm above it. It means I am under it and I have to do the same thing. It's very hard to do. But I'm calling us because I know this. I know it's true. And I know the empty, meaningless life that a lot of you have had right now and the frustrating life has been because you've been trying to follow two masters. You're trying to follow one on one side, knowing the master of the Lord, Jesus Christ. On the other side, you're trying to live for yourself. And the world's giving you all the options over here. And you're like a fish going up a stream. It's everything's coming against you. But did you know what? God designed salmon to go against the stream. And did you know he designed you to be able to be successful in going against the the stream of our culture? You can win. And we can win. And some of us are going to win a gold medal. Even with the current going against us. And everybody can run and win your race. You can't say that in the Olympics. But in faith, I can say that. Everybody, run your race. Everybody, win your race. Why? Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do it all for the glory of Christ, and you'll win. Amen? Amen. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Pray, Lord, you help us to consider these words. These are very, very serious, somber words to consider. And the decisions we make should not be made lightly. We should think about them, reflect on them, Lord, and decide whether or not we are going to submit to you or we're going to be in defiance to you. There's no in-between ground. If we say no to you, it means no. If we say later, I'll think about it, that means no. Father, if we say yes, we'll be tested in our yes. It's not easy, I know. Lord, you know this. But I pray, Father, for every brother and sister here in Christ that's sharing this time together today, that we might reflect on ourselves and ask this question, is it really all about you or is it all about me? And then we need to make a right choice.